Welcome uh, to the U of Care podcast. My name is Oliver Grantman, and today we are profiling a researcher of the Care Center. And I'm happy to welcome uh, Professor Robert Lehman. Welcome, Professor Lehman. Uh, can you introduce yourself briefly? Sure, sure. I'm uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Health Education and Behavior at the University of Florida, and I'm also the Mary F. Lane Endowed Professor in my department. Great. Uh, so uh, with your position, uh, obviously, and your experience, uh, what got you actually interested in the field of addiction research initially, and uh, what in particular does it have to do with the field of, um, of health uh, and uh, human performance? Because that's where you are located. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, my, uh, my department is located in the College of Health and Human Performance, absolutely. Uh, what got me interested in the addictions initially, it wasn't really a dramatic story. Uh, as a college undergraduate, uh, I guess to back up, uh, not to get too you're highly autobiographical, but uh, as a high school student, I lived, uh, uh, it might not shock people to know that I lived a relatively sheltered life. Uh, so coming to college was an eye opener in a lot of ways. And it was really interesting to me. And, and I went to a liberal arts school. I did not, not go to a uh, you know, party school by, by any measure, but, but nonetheless, we certainly had uh, you know, drinking, including underage drinking going on. And it was really interesting to me how some of my colleagues, uh, you know, Sunday through, you know, depending Thursday or Friday during the day were a certain type of folks. And then, uh, you know, Friday and Saturday night, they would act very differently. And those disinhibiting effects were really interesting to me and are still interesting to me. And so it was that. And relatedly, I myself was was a, a non-drinker through much of my undergrad career uh, i was at a uh, you know a party actually just a few months shy of my 21st birthday and i just figured what the heck and you know i had a drink for the first time uh, but my non-drinking wasn't really because of a particularly uh, moral stance i just wasn't particularly tempted to do it going back to my sheltered uh, existence in high school and earlier it wasn't part of my life my friends didn't do it so uh, I just wasn't really tempted, but clearly some of my, my colleagues were tempted. And I think the effects of it, one, and just the fact, again, that some of my fellow students were tempted and I wasn't, and I had another small group of, of friends who weren't, those two things interested me. And with a couple of, if you want to say, divergences, other than that, it's, it's been pretty much off to the races since then. Interesting. So basically, you already got interested during your undergraduate years observing right. others. And then that played also into your graduate studies already uh, doing addiction research. Absolutely. And actually, in, in undergrad, my honors thesis was on uh, college alcohol use, so, uh, believe it or not, and uh, was able to publish that. And that's one of the things that got me going with this. But when I went to grad school, I thought uh, two different times, actually. Uh, I went to grad school at one program, and it just wasn't the right fit, so I ended up leaving, took two years off to work, and then went back to grad school. But both of the times I started grad school, I thought I wanted to do a different type of research, health-related, but not addiction. And addiction kept bringing me back in. It was kind of an Al Pacino and the Godfather Part Three type of an experience where I try to get out, and they keep pulling me back in. So I, I kept coming back to it for, for different reasons. But in, uh, when I went back to grad school to stay, I had two parallel lines of research and one involved the, the addictions. So how does your current work, uh, what you're focusing on now, um, compare or relate to uh, what you did during your graduate work, uh, was there kind of like a, a straight trajectory? I mean, you already said that you got kind of drawn back into addiction yeah. research. Um, was it kind of straightforward or is it really an evolution as you went and, and discovered certain, uh, certain findings uh, that you then kind of build on that and it led you down a certain path? 
Yeah. I guess, well, not to get overly, uh, you know, jargony, but I think it's, you know, when we do uh, statistics, we end up and we're, we're mapping different observations and different points to look at relationships between uh, two classes of variables. What it ends up being is kind of a, you know, a dot across an array and we draw a straight that line through it. So that's kind of what my career has been. I suppose if you want to draw a straight line through it, you easily can, but there have been different, you know, divergences as well. But uh, for the straight line point of view, uh, I mentioned the disinhibiting effects that my colleagues, my fellow uh, undergraduate students seem to uh, events with drinking. So my dissertation was to develop a new measure of disinhibiting effects of alcohol. So there, there's a line. And at some point, I don't remember when, uh, when I was in grad school, toward the end probably, uh, most likely actually because in a prior, um, prior research focus, one of my mentors as a grad student did research uh, administering alcohol to, uh, to human participants in the lab. Um, and I thought that was, wow, what an interesting tool. And I set out in, um, in postdoc to learn how to do that. And so I do that. I'm fortunate enough to have a lab space here uh, where we uh, administer alcohol to, to participants. And part of that uh, is, of course, to observe the effects of alcohol, including the, the disinhibiting effects. We have a session in the hallway of the building where I am now. We're setting up for a session later on today. So, so again, the, the, the straight line from the initial interest is, is definitely there, even though I've, I've kind of gone in a few different sub-directions or however you want to think of it. Interesting. So you are primarily focusing on the disinhibiting effects of alcohol then on human behavior. Mm -hmm. um, what else is, would you say, uh, is related to your research uh, when you talk specifically about the disinhibiting effects that lead to potentially uh, changes in behavior and how it affects human health then that change in behavior? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. The change in behavior is a main focus for us. So the studies we do fall into two main classes. So one has to do with etiology, which is really just a fancy term that encompasses risk factors. So why are some folks more likely to have an issue with addictive behaviors than others? And then, and then why is that? What, what sort of underlies that, that risk? Uh, and that's what I've been talking about so far in terms of my initial interest. But we're also uh, interested as you alluded in, as, as you alluded to, in new interventions. And we use our laboratory space for both purposes, to try to understand those risk factors better and also to test new interventions. And while we work in a number of different populations, uh, college-aged and just older folks is still my main population. So again, going back to the, to the uh, earlier work. But we did some research, this was outside of the lab, but we did some research extending work that was done in Australia and New Zealand on a very brief web-based screening and intervention. So uh, it's focused primarily for young folks, but it definitely is something that could be acclimated for older adults, that one fills out a brief assessment online for a few minutes, and it provides a four-part personalized feedback that couches your drinking among your peers and where you stand in terms of certain markers, in terms of alcohol use disorder risk. So that's something we've done. Uh, we recently, completed again, using the lab space that we have in part and alcohol administration as a tool. Uh, a few months ago, we completed a study to test a uh, smartphone breathalyzer device and app uh, as a moderate drinking tool. So this produces an accurate uh, breath alcohol reading if one uses it uh, as it's indicated. And we wanted to test the extent to which that might be a moderate drinking tool along with a couple of other technology-based tools. And then we were fortunate enough in June to receive funding for a new study to test an app that will deliver uh, some questions, but the main thing it will deliver is a cognitive test. Uh, it's called the Cued Go No Go task. And the nice thing and interesting thing about that is we have a good sense of the effect of alcohol impairment on performance on that task. So we're gonna use that, that literature, those many findings, mainly from uh, somebody I'm proud to call a collaborator now, Dr. Mark Fillmore from Kentucky, who's done these studies over so many years, but we're gonna use that wealth of knowledge to provide personalized feedback to folks, comparing their performance on that task when they're drinking compared to before drinking and offer them some advice relatedly. In a nutshell, 
you perform the task, uh, for, for most folks who have had some, some alcohol, you perform the task more effectively in terms of less errors before you started drinking, and you also did it a little more quickly, and this is what that performance might mean. And uh, hopefully to give people pause before making decisions like driving under the influence, leaving wherever they are to drink with an individual they might not know, and, uh, and et cetera. So those are a few things in the, in the intervention realm that we're interested in. Interesting. So that leads me to uh, the implications, the practical and clinical implications of your work. And you already mentioned quite a few of these that are directly translating already, uh, like really uh, handheld, basically directly usable as apps for the general population. I think we all are aware of the potential risks obviously associated with um, acute alcohol exposure when somebody, not necessarily, like you said, your younger colleagues in, in college that are not necessarily uh, frequent drinkers during, during the week, but rather what we may call binge drinking on the weekend, right? Um, and, and for those who are still able to make um, decisions about whether they are able to drive or uh, they are able to um, to uh, perform certain tasks um, to use such an app uh, to to make those decisions uh, on on a conscious level. I, I can see the practical implications. Are any apps already available uh, for download on 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 Android and iPhone devices? Hmm. So the smartphone breathalyzer device and app that we tested in the study that we finished a few months ago, that's commercially available. So one can purchase that from um, Amazon or, or wherever one gets uh, such items. I believe it costs about $100. The, uh, we also tested a blood alcohol content estimator app. And unfortunately, when we started the study, that was readily available on the iTunes store, but then it ended up coming off the iTunes store. But uh, if there's anything uh, I can do with the creator of the app to advocate for making it more available widespread, uh, for my part, I'm going to do it because it's a nice, uh, it's a nice app. It provides estimated uh, estimates. Estimates are always limited because they're just that, they're estimates. They they can't really account for individual differences in how people metabolize alcohol, but it's still a useful tool. And I think the evidence that we we gathered from this study supports that. So hopefully that will be uh, back available soon, but the breathalyzer device and app is readily available. Now, you mentioned also that, um, you, uh, that you have other apps potentially um, coming to the mm -hmm. market or uh, being available soon uh, that provide people with the risk of developing an alcohol use disorder. Uh, you mentioned Australia, uh, that that might be something that you're testing there at the moment. Um, people are always concerned about their privacy and the data that is being collected. Uh, are such apps uh, completely anonymous? Is there any data that you collect or any risk that folks might be associated with the data that, that is collected? or? Yeah, so it, it depends on whether an app is something that we're creating for research and then a commercially available app. So the best information, since I'll go with the commercially available app first because that's probably where the greater concern is, the best information we have available is that it, those type of apps, or certainly the, app we, the apps we used in this research, collect only general tracking information, not information about one's name, phone number, and, and what have you. But I do you know, preface that with the information we have available, and we're all learning uh, on an almost daily basis where our information becomes uh, not as private as we think. But to our, our best knowledge, it's really just a tracking, general geographic, uh, that type of thing. And an app uh, that we would develop, such as the upcoming study I mentioned, the grant that we had uh, funded in June for the Cognitive Task app, we certainly aren't going to, uh, we're not going to track individuals' personal information uh, with the app. So when um, folks enroll in a research study, of course, we need to know their, uh, their identity, we need to know their address, and uh, if they're going to make more than a little bit of money, their social security number to pay them. Uh, but that information is all kept separate from uh, from the app and the app data. Yeah, there are a lot of 
federal laws that guide mm -hmm. exactly yes. what you can do with the information and how it is protected. So right. um, in regards to alcohol use disorders and the research that you are currently doing, where do you see the major challenges moving forward? I mean, you're not only looking, you, you're both looking at prevention and intervention. Uh, mm -hmm. How somebody who might be at risk of developing an alcohol use disorder, how you can help them to prevent actually going down that road and, and sliding into either becoming a binge drinker or really developing a chronic alcohol use disorder. Where do you see the major challenges that your research and other researchers are facing, particularly related uh, to, 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 to your area of research? Yeah. So my, my primary research focus and population is what we refer to as secondary prevention and for, for younger folks. So by secondary prevention, we mean folks who have begun to use a substance have had maybe some negative consequences, but they haven't yet had the more serious consequences. So we're trying to you know, change that trajectory from a trajectory that might lead to alcohol use disorder, as you say, or more severe alcohol use disorder, because frankly, some uh, even our young adult participants in our studies do meet criteria for alcohol use disorder. But to try to avoid more severe alcohol use disorder anyway. So that's our, our space. And what I think that we as a field have done a, a pretty good job with to this point are interventions along the lines of the, the first one I mentioned, the very brief web-based intervention. So that's based on uh, uh, principles called motivational interviewing. So it's not the same as motivational interviewing, which needs to happen in person, but uh, that intervention is based on those principles. And, and just to make a long story short, it's a non-judgmental approach that you're trying to marshal the person's own resources and inclination toward behavior change and to bolster those and to provide some concrete tips and if the person is interested in advice to kind of set them on their way. Uh, so it's not a situation where we're providing a lot of direct advice. It's really about uh, again, empowering the person, marshalling their resources and, and what have you. So we've done a good job with different variants of that. I think a great analogy for this that I heard from uh, the great Dr. Ken, uh, Ken Schur, who's actually visiting us in care in the spring, as a, a little plug there. Uh, the analogy he drew was to stereo equipment, which I'm not an expert in, but said based on, and this might be a little bit of a dated reference now, but for $100 or $200, at least at the time, you can get about the maximum quality sound that's available out there for someone. But the people who are really focused on music spend a lot of time, money, and effort chasing after that last 10 to 15%. So we know what, how those motivational interviewing based interventions work. We could pay, maybe tweak to enhance them by 10, 15%. Uh, they have a lot of advantages, but the challenge with those is that we expect folks to do those interventions. It could be in person in a counselor's office on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, somebody in one of my studies could do this web-based intervention Wednesday morning at 11 a.m., say. All right, that's fine, and, and there's a good chance they'll glean some benefit from that. But the challenge is that we expect the individual to implement what they, how they benefited, what they got out of that intervention the next Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and not just then, every Thursday, Friday, or Saturday night going forward. And when you think of it that way, even though we're providing good content in these interventions, it's almost a surprise that they do, they do work. And, and they do. They tend to significantly reduce drinking. Uh, it's on the small end, but we always weigh those kind of reductions with how much time and effort whether there are side effects and this type of counseling or intervention is not likely to have side effects. So really from a public health point of view, any kind of reproducible, even small reduction is a win in our view. But I think what we've failed to do as well is give folks tools that they can use in the moment to reduce their drinking. We're trying uh, and others are trying to address that gap. So that's why the smartphone breathalyzer, that's why the estimator app, that's why we're interested in, uh, this cognitive task-based app uh, to try to, to seal that gap and give folks some tools that they can use in, in the moment uh, for folks who may not want to take medication or it could potentially, this isn't what we've done in the study so far, but it could potentially augment uh, benefits of medication that somebody has, has both benefits, both, both tools that they can use in the moment. 
Great. Yeah. I, I think there is yet a lot that can be done considering that alcohol is one of the most common substance use disorders um, and that a lot of people suffer from it in, uh, uh, and are affected by it, not only the individuals themselves, but also their caretakers, their families, their friends, um, and the amount of, um, of, of, of work hours lost, the amount of money that um, or, or financial resources that we have to dedicate to it um, is, is significant. So um, there's, there's a lot that, that we can do, and uh, thanks to you and, and others in the area uh, that are making strides in that regard with really practical applications. I think right. that's, that's important that can translate into, into, uh, into everyday life to help people. Right. Okay, uh, well, thank you so much for taking the time today uh, to tell us about your research, uh, about um, your um, mission, your, your vision also for where this research um, will be going or might be going, the challenges that you are facing. Um, and uh, we look forward to obviously uh, hearing more from you in, in future years and uh, wishing you the best uh, for your future research. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lehman. Take and care. this was uh, today's um, uh, researcher profile from the U of Care. Uh, listen to the next uh, researcher profile and the next U of Care podcast. Thank you, everybody.